Hi, it's Katrina, the Goat Man. The Goat Man is an enormous humanoid cryptid, half man, half goat, measuring around seven feet tall. There have been reports of sightings in Alabama, Louisiana, Maryland, Texas, and several other places. In Maryland, legend goes that he was once a man who kept goats who was lonely and angry and went crazy when local teens killed his beloved goats. Some legends depict the goat man as a mythical beast or a cryptid and might be related to the chupacabra. Another version of the goat man legend asserts that he is the result of the experiments of a mad scientist working at the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, a USDA facility. Someone mixed the DNA of a goat and a human, creating this monstrosity. In any case, you never want to run into him. He hides in the woods terrorizing teenagers and lovers, beheading dogs and wreaking havoc in general while squealing and making goat noises. Whatever happened to him in the past, he is hungry and out for blood. If you get too close to his lair, he will come out to get you and it won't be pretty. Apparently these stories have been around for a long time, but the goat man really became famous in the 60s when 16 hikers disappeared, never to be seen again. In the 70s, the Prince George's County News published an article that described several ghosts and monsters that allegedly haunted the area around Fletcher Town Road in Bowie, including the Goat Man. Just two weeks later, a family's dog went missing and then only the head was found near Fletcher Town Road. Perhaps it had been hit by a train, but locals started saying it was the Goat Man. The night the canine disappeared, locals claimed to have seen a large, animal-like creature that walks on its hind legs. It is said to be related to the Pope Lick monster from Kentucky, another half-goat, half-man creature that also chases down unsuspecting victims with an axe. He started out as a crazy person who escaped from the mental hospital and then went to live with goats. If you ever see a wild goat, get out of there as quickly as possible. Emela Ntuka Hailing from West Central Africa, including the Congo's Likowala Swamp region and possibly parts of Cameroon, the Amela Ntuka is a massive, ferocious cryptid that reportedly kills anything it crosses paths with. Known to locals as the Elephant Killer, the hairless, single-horned creature is roughly the same size as an African elephant, around 13,230 pounds, and resembles a rhinoceros in shape and appearance. For some reason, it is known for killing elephants by stabbing and disemboweling them with its horn. Lucien Blanco, chief game inspector in French Equatorial Africa in the 1950s, wrote of a ferocious creature in the Congo, larger than a buffalo, that was considered the most dangerous animal by the local Kele pygmies. The semi-aquatic Emela Ntuka is equipped with stump-like legs, a bulky body, and a crocodile-like tail. It's known for emitting startling noises like snorts and growls. Despite being herbivorous, the creature is known for being highly aggressive and territorial, striking fear into the people of the area. When Dr. Roy Mackel traveled to the Congo in 1981 in search of another cryptid, a sauropod dinosaur called the Mokele Mbebe, locals expressed far more interest in the elephant-goring Emela Ntuka, or the killer of elephants. He started looking for that too. Unlike a rhino, it has a long tail and a really thick horn, so going along with the description, Dr. McCall theorized that it could be a type of horned dinosaur called a Centrosaurus, but the question of exactly what the creature is remains unanswered to this day. The 1933 book, 18 Years on Lake Bangeweulu by author J.E. Hughes claims that Waushi tribesmen killed an animal resembling the Emela Untuka along the banks of the Luapula River, but the creature was not mentioned by name until 1954, when it appeared in an article in the journal Mammalia. While a detailed record of sightings is lacking, the Emela Ntuka was reportedly last spotted in Kenya. Many claim to have seen the creature itself, or evidence of it, but its existence remains unproven. The Mothman The Mothman of Point Pleasant, maybe one of America's creepiest legendary cryptids, originated in Clendenin, West Virginia on November 12, 1966, when a cemetery worker spotted a massive creature passing overhead, swiftly passing from one tree to the next. Following that first reported sighting, the elusive Mothman reappeared three days later in Point Pleasant in the form of a six to seven foot tall gray winged entity that two couples observed standing in front of their car, seemingly trying to evade the vehicle's bright lights. In an interview with the Point Pleasant Register, eyewitnesses Roger Scarberry and Steve Mallett described the creature as having bright red eyes set roughly six inches apart and a wingspan measuring around 10 feet. Although a clumsy runner, the being skillfully flew at up to 100 miles per hour. 
More witnesses came forward claiming to have seen the Mothman, including Salem, West Virginia resident Newell Partridge. While investigating strange noises from outside, the homeowner encountered two bright red eyes that resembled bicycle reflectors. Not everyone immediately believed that the Mothman was real, including Dr. Robert L. Smith of West Virginia University, who suggested that the apparition was instead a sandhill crane, a bird that can grow as tall as an average man, and whose eyes are surrounded by red coloring. Other skeptics posit that a rather clever prankster started the Mothman legend. People also blamed the national press, which sparked mass hysteria in the region, stirring people into a panic that perhaps made them think that they were seeing the Mothman when they were instead witnessing known, everyday large owl species. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Jorogumo The Jorogumo is a type of yokai, or supernatural monster or spirit from Japanese folklore. The name itself literally means binding woman which is fitting given that it is often depicted as a spider that takes on the appearance of a beautiful seductress. It uses its looks to entice and ultimately devour young men. According to legends, when a spider lives to be 400 years old, it gains magical powers that allow it to grow and shapeshift, helping it to hunt for humans. They are said to spin silk strong enough to easily trap fully grown men. They also have a potent venom that can weaken their victims gradually so they can relish in their sufferings. They also have the power to control smaller spiders, using them to do their bidding. They can disguise their webs as homes and will play music to seduce men. The music serves to distract the unsuspecting victims while they spin their spider silk around them in order to devour them later. In Izu City, Shizuoka, Japan, it is believed that there is a legendary spider mistress living in Joran Falls that uses its web to pull unsuspecting victims into the water to drown them. Mapping Wari in its original form, the Mapinguari was an Amazonian shaman who discovered the secret to immortality. Displeased with his discovery, the gods turned him into a hairy beast that reportedly wanders the border between Brazil and Bolivia to this day. Sometimes described as a humanoid creature with a mouth situated in the center of its stomach and rumored to stand at over 7 feet tall on its hind legs, it has one eye, long claws, and caiman skin. But the worst and most famous thing about it is its putrid smell that is so unbearable it will knock you right out. The Mapinguari has been seen walking uneasily on two legs and more confidently on all fours. It's fast and agile, according to some eyewitness reports, while others describe it as slow moving and the creature is most active during twilight and at night. Older sightings describe the cryptid as ape-like, while more contemporary accounts mention a giant sloth-like creature. One prevailing theory is that the Mapinguari is a giant ground sloth that has survived past the Ice Age. Meanwhile, some experts have theorized that the Mapinguari was a spectacled bear, making its seasonal appearance in the region, but wild bears have never been recorded in Brazil, making this possibility unlikely. Scientists have yet to prove that the Mapinguari exists, but the sightings continue into modern times. Jersey Devil Legend holds that the Jersey Devil was the unwanted 13th son of Mother Leeds, one of the earliest settlers of southern New Jersey's Pine Barrens. Unable to afford to raise the baby, Leeds and her husband offered the rejected child to the devil before his birth in 1735. The delivery was routine, and at first the baby boy seemed healthy. Within minutes, however, the infant began transforming into a hideous, never-before-seen creature, growing rapidly and sprouting horns from his head and talons from his fingers. As the demonic baby wailed, he grew wings and hair appeared all over his body. His eyes turned bright red and he attacked and killed his mother and her midwives, marking the beginning of the Jersey Devil's alleged reign of terror. The monster continued along his path of destruction, killing his father and anyone else in sight that he could get to. Today, he supposedly continues to terrorize anyone he possibly can. Eyewitness accounts of the Jersey Devil in the Pine Barrens region were common during the 18th and 19th centuries, with other reports detailing eerie wailing and slaughtered livestock and pets. Starting in 1909, the creature's range began expanding into other towns and cities, eventually reaching as far as Philadelphia and Camden. At the peak of the panic, children stopped attending school, and bloodhounds refused to follow the Jersey Devil's trail, according to Weird New Jersey. Witnesses describe the monster as resembling a flying kangaroo or an ostrich-like creature, often with a dog's head, a horse's face, deer-like antlers, a forked reptilian tail, and leathery wings. Although modern sightings occur on a far lesser scale than in the past, many people remain die-hard believers in the Jersey Devil. Mongolian Death Worm 
With a name meaning large intestine worm, the Olgoi Korkoi is a dark red, four-foot-long cryptid resembling a giant earthworm and originating from Mongolia. Also known as the Mongolian death worm, it reportedly lives below ground in the southern Gobi Desert, only surfacing during summer and when the ground is wet. Early sightings claim that the Olgwe Korkoi can spit venom or even acid from its mouth, and that the slime coating its body is deadly to the touch, more or less instantly. The creature is even rumored to be able to electrocute its victims from afar. But the Mongolian deathworm is rarely spotted and is photographed even less. Many have ventured out in search of the creepy cryptid, but nobody has produced solid evidence of its existence. Some diehard believers are undeterred by this lack of physical proof, believing that the stories they hear are nonetheless based in historical truth and that the descriptions of the creature are consistent enough to lend some credibility to eyewitness claims. Scientists, on the other hand, are doubtful that the Mongolian deathworm truly exists, especially since nobody has ever found evidence of any live or dead specimens. At the same time, they've also failed to disprove that the creepy crawly cryptid is out there. Iliamna Lake Monster Commonly known as Ili, the Iliamna Lake Monster resides in a small fishing village next to Alaska's largest lake and is a staple of local mythology. Measuring somewhere between 10 and 30 feet long, the aquatic cryptid resembles a long marine creature, unlike a whale or a seal, with a long tail, distinct fins, and a square-shaped head, which it reportedly uses for inflicting blunt force into small boats and other structures. Native legends describe it as a large beast that roams the waters. The Tlingit people told the first tales of a monster living in the lake, which they called the Gonakadet. Meanwhile, the Aleut people called the purported fish monster the jig ik nak According to local legend, these creatures prefer to travel in groups, and rumor has it that they attacked warriors and canoes in the past. The Iliamna lake monster has been sighted plenty of times since then, including from overhead flights. In 1979, the Anchorage Daily News offered $100,000 to anyone who could produce solid evidence of the creature's existence, at which time sightings of the cryptid ironically slowed down. It was also featured on the Animal Planet show River Monsters. But the Iliamna Lake Monster remains a mere legend, as far as science is concerned, and there may even be a perfectly logical explanation for the strange animals people claim to see. According to biologist Jeremy Wade, people may be mistaking the white sturgeon, the largest fish in North America, as the Iliamna Lake Monster. But there are fishermen that would know the difference, who have said that the monster is not the same. Indigenous to Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, the species can reach up to 1,500 pounds and 20 feet in length. The white sturgeon is a bottom-dwelling fish, which would explain why it's rarely seen, and its coloring seems to match the aluminum shade described by past eyewitnesses. But nobody knows for sure if the white sturgeon is the Iliamna lake monster, so for now, the case remains open. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Monkey Man of Delhi in May 2001, claims circulated of a half-man, half-monkey creature appearing on the streets of New Delhi, India. Known as the Kala Bandar, which is Hindi for black monkey, the cryptid reportedly came out primarily at night and attacked dozens of people by clawing and biting at them. While eyewitness accounts are inconsistent, the Kala Bandar was generally described as being around four feet tall with metal claws, glowing red eyes, and a metal helmet. It was covered in black hair and had three buttons down its chest. Another version of the cryptid claims that the monkey man is around eight feet tall, of muscular stature, and capable of leaping from one building to the next. People were so convinced that the Kala Bandar existed, police issued a sketch of the suspect in question. While the case of the monkey man of New Delhi is generally chalked up to mass hysteria, some people bore disturbing wounds that appear to be legitimately inflicted by an animal of some sort. We just don't quite know what it was. Ogopogo Nicknamed Augie, the Ogopogo, or Okanagan Lake Monster, is a lake monster of Canadian folklore, said to inhabit Okanagan Lake in British Columbia. Its legend dates as far back as the 1700s, with origins tied to First Nation tribes who spoke of a water beast in the lake. The creature is often depicted as a multi-humped, serpentine sea dragon with green or black skin and the head of a horse, snake, or a sheep. The first known instance of a white settler spotting the beast occurred in 1872, when a woman named Susan Allison, the first non-native person to live in the region, reportedly saw the Ogopogo. Sightings continue into modern times, with at least three reported instances happening in 2018. 
Last year, a local man named Jim LaRock claimed to have captured footage of the Ogopogo, which appeared in the clip to look like a giant serpentine creature at least 120 feet long, while his son was paddleboarding on Lake Okanagan. He first noticed what he believed was the Ogopogo after hearing a loud, repetitive swooshing sound, and he thankfully had his camera on him at the time. La Roque, a longtime resident who owns a local liquor store, said that the creature appeared to have at least seven fins, and that if you watch the video footage closely enough, you can see the creature lifting and slapping its fins into the water. Environmental scientist Dr. Robert Young was less wowed than many by the clip, which he believes may show a natural phenomenon called overturn, which happens seasonally where lake layers of different temperatures and depths will pass each other. What do you think? Is the Ogopogo the real deal? Or are people imagining what they see? Let me know in the comments below. Flick Flack Spider The Flick Flack Spider is highly entertaining. Like a gymnast, it flips and twists to move quickly along the desert sands. Discovered in 2009 by scientist Ingo Reckenberg, after whom the species is named, Sabrenus Reckenbergi, and officially described in 2014, the Flick Flack Spider is best known for its ability to cartwheel or somersault away from predators. It catapults itself forward at a distance of up to 6.5 feet per second while in cartwheel mode, traveling twice as fast as it does at normal walking speed. Even more impressively, the species can efficiently somersault uphill. This spider is endemic to the Erg Chebi Desert in southeastern Morocco, near the Algerian border. After stumbling upon the strange creature, Reckenberg took a specimen to Germany, where arachnologist Peter Jager concluded that it was a previously unidentified species. In a statement regarding the discovery, Jager explained that the spider's unique way of moving around is the main characteristic that differentiates it from a very similar-looking but much slower-moving Tunisian species, Sabrenus velosus. The nocturnal creature burrows tube-like towers in the sand which are held together by silk threads. Dr. Reckenberg was so inspired by this spider that he created a spider robot modeled after the Flick Flack called Tabit. It can walk and somersault, helping it to cross rough terrain, so it might be a useful style of locomotion for robots used to explore the bottom of the sea, or even Mars. Sydney Funnel Web Spider Out of the 40 known funnel web spider species, the Sydney Funnel Web Spider is known as the deadliest because it is involved in the most human fatalities. Native to urban areas and forests in eastern Australia, the creature doesn't hesitate to bear its powerful fangs, which are capable of penetrating nails and shoes. It also eagerly makes other aggressive displays the moment it feels threatened, including rearing back on its hind legs. While Sydney funnel web spiders rarely target humans for any other reason than feeling challenged or cornered, they are often found in close proximity to people. Males will sometimes wander around looking for a mate and fall into swimming pools, where they can survive for a really long time. They will also wander into people's gardens and homes, getting trapped until someone finds them. Surprise! These creatures do not chase after humans, but they will respond to one when confronted, even if the encounter is unintentional or maybe with good intentions like trying to trap it to take it outside. It doesn't know the difference. The Sydney funnel web spider's bite can be fatal. In fact, its venom is more potent to humans than that of any other spider species, including other funnel web spiders, and can kill a human in about 15 minutes. Thankfully, not all bites are venomous to begin with, and an anti-venom was developed in 1981, followed by a concerted effort to improve first aid techniques. A bite should be treated as venomous just in case, and you should put pressure on the bite and try not to move too much, just like with a snake bite. Usually, these spiders like to hide under rocks and logs where they can stay cool and damp. They will create a burrow with a silk entrance so they can feel the vibrations of their prey and then dart out and grab it. They can be pretty large, too. One, affectionately called Big Boy at the Australian Reptile Park, reached 10 centimeters long. The Mostly Vegetarian Spider Bagheera kiplingi is a jumping spider species that lives in Latin America. Its name was clearly inspired by the Jungle Book. Its distinguishing characteristic, out of roughly 40,000 known spider species, is its mostly vegetarian diet. While it resembles other jumping spiders when it comes to its large eyes and its leaping ability, B. kiplingi is not a predator, making it incredibly unique not only among jumping spiders but among spiders in general. 
Most spiders are carnivores who avoid vegetation and typically only eat foliage unintentionally, according to National Geographic. To find a species that prefers an herbivorous diet is nothing short of remarkable. B. kiplingi acquires food by taking advantage of an unlikely partnership between ants and acacia trees. Ants act as bodyguards for the trees, which in turn provide the insects with shelter in the form of hollow thorns, as well as nutrition via nodules that sprout from the leaves called belchian bodies. The spider snatches up these nutrients, taking the ants' food away, and chows down on the mostly vegetarian feast. Researcher Christopher Meehan spent seven years observing bee kiplingi, which he noticed is almost always found on acacia trees with an ant population since non-infested trees do not grow Belgian bodies. These nodules comprise roughly 90% of the spider's diet in Mexico and around 60% of its diet in Costa Rica. Once in a great, great while, a spider will snack on ant larvae, flies, or members of its species. Generally speaking, however, the creature opts for a plant-based diet. In addition to trying to understand why the spider prefers vegetarian cuisine, scientists remain struck with one major mystery how B. kiplingi digests the highly fibrous Belgian bodies it loves so much, which most spiders are incapable of digesting. Black Widow Spider The term Black Widow includes several species who share a major common trait, extremely toxic venom. Black Widow spiders come from the Latrodectus genus, which encompasses Black Widows, Brown Widows, and other similar species. Found in temperate regions worldwide, these nocturnal half-inch long creatures are easily identified by their bright hourglass-shaped marking on their abdomen. With a bite up to 15 times more powerful than that of a rattlesnake, these spiders are capable of inflicting victims with venom that attacks the nervous system, causing symptoms such as severe pain, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, and diaphragm paralysis which makes it difficult to breathe, according to National Geographic. Children, along with the elderly and infirm, are at the highest risk of dying from a black widow bite. Most victims survive, suffering little damage, so that's good news. Black widow spiders are not aggressive by nature. They're defensive, meaning that they will respond to a perceived threat by biting. Unfortunately, humans are sometimes bitten after accidentally sitting on or otherwise unintentionally crossing paths with a black widow. Given the potency of the black widow's venom, it's not surprising that WebMD and other medical websites advise seeking medical attention for bites and rushing children and other especially vulnerable victims to the emergency room. Scorpion-tailed spider Endemic to Australia, the scorpion-tailed spider is a small orb weaver measuring just 0.63 inches long meaning you might have to gain an up-close look to notice what's unique about the species. Adult females have a long, thin, scorpion-like appendage attached to the tip of their abdomen. This bendable tail comes in handy, with its ability to arch over the specimen's backside, disguising her as an angry scorpion and keeping wary potential predators at bay. And it lengthens with each molt. Males who measure just 0.08 inches or 2 millimeters long and juveniles lack this distinctive feature, but they're no less harmless than the females who are equipped with a unique appendage. In fact, the tail is essentially an optical illusion meant to intimidate by looks alone. It's harmless to humans and cannot sting, period. Besides its falsely frightening appearance, the female's tail serves as useful camouflage, effectively making the creature look like a dead leaf caught in a web. Brown Recluse Found primarily throughout the southern and central United States, the brown recluse is considered one of the most venomous spiders in the country, and it's also the most common brown spider species. It's possible, but extremely unlikely, to encounter a brown recluse outside its typical range, which consists of most of the southeastern and central United States. Brown recluse spiders are identified by a violin-shaped marking on the top of their head and thorax, with older specimens bearing darker markings. But the best way to determine if a spider is a brown recluse is to examine its six eyes, making it unique compared to most other spiders who have eight eyes. Might be a little difficult though, I think you have to get kind of close to count its eyes, so I don't think that this is the best advice. The species also has a velvety, uniformly brown abdomen. When in doubt, 
don't touch it. Measuring just 3 eighths of an inch long and 3 sixteenths of an inch wide, a brown recluse might be difficult to spot in the first place, but if you encounter one, you'll know it. Because the spider's bite is venomous, the National Institutes of Health recommend seeking emergency treatment right away. While the species typically only attacks when threatened, it's relatively easy for a person to unintentionally disturb a spider, especially one that makes its way into your clothing or bedding. Bite reactions vary, with the vast majority of victims healing without any scarring and without needing medical attention. Others sometimes suffer from a volcano lesion, where the damaged tissue becomes necrotic or gangrenous, leaving an open wound that can grow as large as someone's hand. When it comes to serious bites, recovery can take eight weeks or longer. Fishing spiders Whether you call them fishing spiders, raft spiders, dock spiders, or wharf spiders, Chances are you've encountered them near the water if you live along the east coast of the United States. Outside of North America, these creatures can be found in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand as well. There are over 100 fishing spider species belonging to the Dolomites genus. Nearly all of them are semi-aquatic, and eight are common in the United States. They are larger than many of the tiny spiders we're used to encountering in our everyday lives, and they feast primarily on tadpoles, small insects, and other invertebrates, with some species even targeting small fish. The most fascinating characteristic of fishing spiders is their ability to walk on water. Fishing spiders hunt by remaining patiently at the water's edge until they detect the ripple of prospective prey, at which point they will run across the water and inject their venom into the target. In addition to the fishing spider's impressive walking on water talents, these creatures can also climb efficiently underwater, often diving up to seven inches below the surface to catch their prey. Both capabilities are possible thanks to the creature's hydrophobic or unwettable short, velvety hairs. As fierce as these opportunistic feeders seem, they are far from invincible. Fishing spiders are most often preyed upon by birds and snakes, and young spiders sometimes even fall victims to dragonflies, who are very voracious hunters. Brazilian Wandering Spider Also called armed spiders or banana spiders, Brazilian wandering spiders belong to the genus Phonutria, which translates to murderous in Greek. The name accurately reflects the spider's status as one of the most venomous on Earth, with a bite that can be deadly to humans, especially children. In fact, the Brazilian wandering spider was even featured in the Guinness Book of World Records over several years, claiming the official title of the world's deadliest spider. These bragging rights might be misleading, however, since the creature's lethality depends largely on the amount of venom it injects into its victim. There are eight Brazilian wandering spider species altogether, all of which are found in Brazil, and several which exist in other parts of Latin America. A 2014 article by entomology researcher Richard S. Vetter asserted that the Brazilian wandering spider had made its way into North America and Europe via banana shipments, although in many cases, the infesting offender in question was a similar-looking, yet harmless, misidentified species. Brazilian wandering spiders are quick to act defensive, giving them an inaccurate reputation as inherently aggressive creatures. When threatened, a specimen will assume a defensive posture, including raising its front legs into the air. This position serves as a warning to get away from the spider while you still can. The spider's venom attacks the neuromuscular system, causing initial symptoms such as severe burning pain at the bite site, sweating, and goosebumps. Side effects worsen over the next half hour, graduating to high or low blood pressure, an elevated or decreased heart rate, nausea, hypothermia, vertigo, blurred vision, convulsions, and more. Bites are rare, however, and envenomations are typically mild, according to researcher Richard S. Vetter. To date, there are only 10 recorded cases of a human dying from a wandering spider bite in Brazil. Spitting Spiders Spitting spiders exist all over the world, with specimens in northern Europe usually being found in houses, with those in southern Europe often turning up underneath stones outside of people's homes. Spitting spiders capture prey by firing venom-drenched silk at their target, shooting from the animal's fangs in a zigzag pattern at a top speed of 62 miles per hour the twin streams of silk are not only poisonous, but are also covered in a natural, extremely sticky glue. Prey essentially become helpless once they're hit, with the glue-covered fibers shrinking and trapping them in their place. The spider's next step is to administer a venomous, lethal bite to its unfortunate victim, finally putting the creature out of its misery after ample suffering. 
There are over 250 species of spitting spider, with the most widely distributed species being Cytodes thoracica, a commonly encountered nocturnal spider that prefers warm temperatures. This small creature measures just 0.12 to 0.24 inches, and unlike most spider species, has six eyes rather than eight, but you can probably identify them from their spitting behavior. Cyclocosmia First described in 1871 by Austrian naturalist Anton Asserer, Cyclocosmia is a genus of trapdoor spiders consisting of four species, which are known for having a distinctive, truncated, disc-shaped abdomen. They are also known as the Chinese hourglass spider. To some, the abdomen looks like a coin, a seal, or maybe even an Oreo cookie. What do you think it looks like? Let us know in the comments below! This unique body part is an evolutionary feature that helps the spider evade predators by entering its burrow head first causing the abdominal disc to fit seamlessly with the walls of its home, creating a false, impenetrable trapdoor. The spider camouflages its trapdoor, enabling it to jump out and conveniently snatch prey. The trapdoor spider's camouflage is so effective, researchers have a difficult time spotting it in the wild, perhaps explaining why the scientific community knows so little about it. Either way, Cyclocosmia species are considered among the world's rarest and most ancient spiders. A lot of people seem to think that they are venomous to humans, but that is definitely not the case. Trapdoor spiders take quite a while to reach sexual maturity, but they also live remarkably long lives. In April 2018, the world's longest-lived spider, a female trapdoor spider known simply as Number 16, passed away in Australia at age 43. She spent her entire life inside her burrow, which she never left once, especially as she matured and grew older, making the prospect of relocation more difficult. The creature's longevity, coupled with its frugal use of resources, are a topic of fascination among scientists, who believe humans may stand to gain a lesson or two about sustainable living from trapdoor spiders. Crosby Garrett Helmet in 2010, an Irish detectorist made an incredibly rare find when he was exploring the fields near Crosby Garrett in the county of Cumbria in England. The anonymous searcher had been looking at the fields for the previous two years, but had only found Roman coins and other small artifacts up until that point. That's not too bad either. That all changed when one lucky day he unearthed a Roman cavalry helmet, thought to be from the late 2nd or early 3rd century AD. Further research in the area found that the site had been a Roman settlement, and evidence of earthworks and a Roman road were found thanks to his discovery. The helmet was found in 67 different pieces that were put back together before going up for auction in October 2010. The initial estimate was immediately exceeded and, in the end, it sold to an anonymous bidder for $3.7 million. Just think about it, this could be you! Iron Age Gold Necklaces in 2009, David Booth was using his metal detector in a field for the first time, having only just gotten it to try out his new hobby, and he tested it on knives in his kitchen. But nine paces from where he parked his car, he made one of the most famous finds in Scottish history. He was shocked as he scraped away the soil where his detector had indicated to reveal four gold necklaces known as torques. They were dated to 300 BC and were such an important find that historians have re-examined the ways they look at human society from the time. The intricate designs are in some areas as wide as a finger and were valued at more than 1 million pounds, about 1.3 million dollars. Unfortunately for Booth, the law in Scotland states that treasure hoards belong to the crown rather than the finder or the landowner, so after his moment of fame for his discovery, the necklaces were passed on to a national museum for further study and to be put on display. Viking Board Game Mick Bott, a 73-year-old retired miner and metal detectorist, recently unearthed a Viking board game dating back to 872 AD, roughly 1,150 years ago, in Torxey, Lincolnshire, England. The complete set, consisting of 37 pieces, was used in a chess-like game called Hinefatafel. Probably not how you say that. But it was popular among soldiers due to its strategic nature. Bot discovered the game at a site next to the River Trent, where he spent roughly decades searching for artifacts, making his first discoveries as far back as 1982. The artifact, among other finds by Bot and two fellow metal detectorists, included coins, strap ends, and brooches, all dating to the 9th century, and serves as evidence to archaeologists that Vikings camped through the winter at River Trent in the year 872. Several thousand people reportedly stayed at the site, where they played Hennefetafel to pass the time. 
Researchers hadn't taken Bot's finds seriously at first, but when he presented them with the board game, he finally got their attention. The discovery may constitute the oldest complete set of pieces found at one site, according to artifact consultant Nigel Mills. Of the game pieces, Mills said, no one really appreciated them, but they actually are a very important part of our history. The artifacts were slated to go up for auction, where they were expected to fetch at least 1,000 pounds. It seems like they would be worth more than that. What do you think? A live explosive. Earlier this year, police in Lebanon, Tennessee, reported to the scene of an unexploded World War II era mortar round. The find was made by 13-year-old Blake Davis, who was out exploring with a metal detector along with his 11-year-old brother when he made the disturbing discovery behind Hartman Plantation. They immediately told their mother, who summoned the authorities, and the Tennessee Highway Patrol's bomb squad reported to the scene, along with staff members from Fort Campbell. David said, I saw it and thought it was a piece of metal, but then after looking at it closely, I realized it's an explosion. Smart kid. The bomb squad declared that the weapon was both live and too unstable to be moved, leaving the team with no choice but to perform a controlled detonation at the scene, which many local residents overheard, and they also called the police. That would be pretty scary. They probably should have warned the neighbors. Authorities searched the area carefully for more live explosives before declaring it safe. During World War II, the U.S. military used the area as a training ground, explaining why the mortar was left behind. But this just goes to show you just never know what you might find with a metal detector. Does this make you kind of want to explore with a detector outside? Let me know if you would get one in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already. We have lots more videos coming up. Dentures. This one is a bit weird. In March 2019, in a field in Buckinghamshire, southern England, a metal detectorist and bricklayer named Peter Cross found a 200-year-old set of top dentures. The fascinating discovery was announced late last year. Made from gold and possibly hippopotamus or walrus ivory, the teeth were fashioned to be as lifelike as possible. When I first pulled them up out of the ground, I thought they were sheep's teeth, Cross said in a statement. They would have belonged to a very wealthy person, he said, adding that they date back between 1800 and 1850 and would have cost a fortune at the time. A dentist friend said that the owner would have paid between 200 to 300 pounds in the 1800s and that would have bought half the houses in the Buckinghamshire village of Brill back then, a very affluent village. What do you prefer, half of the town's houses or a set of gold teeth? Let me know in the comments below. The false teeth are missing their bottom half, even after Cross revisited the site multiple times and looked for it. This portion of the dentures would have no metal in it, according to Cross, making them impossible to find with a metal detector and thus complicating the search. The man who discovered the artifact contacted the British Dental Association, the British Museum, and others, and everyone he showed the false teeth to was amazed. Mark Betcher, a metal detector finds consultant at Hansen Auction Group, said that the tusk of the animal, whose ivory was used for the dentures, cleverly fitted the shape of the mouth. He said the front six teeth have retained the enamel of the tusk to give the effect of the surface of a tooth, though I doubt they'll be in a Colgate advert anytime soon. The false teeth were slated to go up for auction, with plans for the property owner to collect half of the profits, and for Cross and Diana Wilde, a fellow metal detectorist who was with him when the dentures were found, to each receive 25%. Proceeds were expected to range between 3,000 and 7,000 pounds. Lost Medieval Coin In August 2019, a metal detectorist rediscovered a lost Scottish medieval coin at an undisclosed site in Norfolk, England. Dating back sometime between 1280 and 1286, the coin features the head of Alexander III of Scotland. Coin expert Dr. Adrian Marsden of the Norfolk Historic Environment Service explained in a BBC interview that someone religious likely wore it as a brooch or a pendant, and that it had traveled some way before ending up where it was found. The side of the coin bearing the cross rather than the head was intended for display. Dr. Marsden further explained, adding that there are also settings for gems, which are no longer there, which represent the five wounds of Christ, so it is symbolic and adds to the religious dimension. The coin's owner would have been relatively wealthy and of good social standing. At the time, when a day's wages amounted to no more than two pennies, the pendant was worth around 20 pounds. 
The artifact was declared a treasure under the UK's 1996 Treasure Act, and the Norwich Castle Museum hopes to obtain the coin and add it to their collection. Centuries Old Sword Fionton Hughes, a 10-year-old schoolboy from County Tyrone in Northern Ireland, recently discovered a 300-year-old sword near his backyard after receiving a metal detector for his birthday. I'm starting to think that this is a really good gift. Don't you kind of want one? Buried about one foot underground, the sword was found when Fionton's metal detector signaled for a third time, after alerting him twice to insignificant trinkets, he said to the BBC. The boy's father, Paul Hughes, was with Fionton when he made the shocking find, which Dad chalked up to a case of beginner's luck. Unsure of the sword's origin or age, the family consulted several antique arms dealerships, who dated it back to sometime during the 18th century. The sword is a basket-hilt type sword as used by English officers and dragoons from about 1720 to 1780, or it could be a Scottish basket-hilt of about 1700 to 1850, antique arms dealer Philip Spooner told the BBC, adding that he believed it was most likely an English officer's sword due to its ornate design. But the rusty, mud-covered sword was admittedly difficult to examine. Not wanting the sword to rust in his garage and fearing that it was deteriorating by the day, the elder Hughes expressed his desire to get to the bottom of its origins so that it may be handed over to qualified experts and perhaps put on display. Shipwrecked Coins Earlier this year, a pair of treasure hunters claimed to have discovered coins from a 1715 Spanish shipwreck along a Florida beach using a metal detector. While searching the sand at the Turtle Trail Beach Access in Vero Beach, 43-year-old Jonah Martinez and his friend unearthed 22 Spanish silver coins from what they believed to be a 305-year-old shipwreck. The hoard, worth an estimated $7,000, likely came from a fleet of 12 Spanish treasure-laden galleons that were en route to Spain on July 31, 1715, when 11 of them sank during a hurricane off the Florida coast. Most of the treasure lost during the tragedy remains in the ocean. Not everyone knows why it's called the Treasure Coast, Martinez said after making the discovery. This is why. It wasn't the biggest or most valuable find for Martinez, an experienced treasure hunter who once discovered $6.5 million worth of gold coins. But it's remarkable in its own right, and the man expressed that he had no desire to sell the hoard, but that he instead planned to keep it, unpolished, near some of his other claimed treasures. To Martinez, it's not about the money anyway. In his words, it's a passion. It's the thrill of the hunt that I love. Hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons. While sweeping the site of the famous Battle of Grunwald in northern Poland, metal detectorists found two 600-year-old battle axes that were used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The artifacts, which are in remarkably good condition, come from what some archaeologists claim was Europe's largest battle during the Middle Ages. Out of the 50,000 soldiers who marched into battle when the Battle of Grunwald commenced on July 15, 1410, only two apparently left behind axe heads. The weapons vary in design, with one having a longer closed shaft and the other possessing a shorter open shaft. Dozens of other artifacts, including swords and spearheads, have been found at the site. During the conflict, Polish and Lithuanian forces fought against the Germanic Teutonic Knights' expansion along the Baltic Sea's southeastern coast. The Teutonic leadership was defeated, and its soldiers were all either killed or taken prisoner by the Polish-Lithuanian forces, which subsequently emerged as one of Europe's most powerful states. Local Pub Horde Luke Mahoney, an experienced 40-year-old metal detectorist who owns a shop in Suffolk, England, discovered the biggest hoard of his lifetime behind a local pub after spending a decade traveling the globe in search of treasure. Isn't that always the way? Searching the globe and then finding things in your own backyard. Earlier this year, after persuading the owners of the Lindsay Rose Pub to let them search the field behind the building, Mahoney and two friends found 100,000 pounds worth of Civil War-era coins. At first, the pub owner and Mahoney's friend, Charlie Buckle, wrote the discovery off as potentially inconsequential. Luke gets quite excited about everything he finds, so at first I was like, yeah, okay, Buckle told the mirror, but then he kept ringing and told me I had to come down and see what he had found. A plow had recently cracked an earthenware pot buried two feet below ground while clearing the 15-acre field. Altogether, Mahoney discovered 1,061 coins dating back between the 15th and 17th century, with the earliest being an Elizabeth I-era shilling from sometime between 1573 and 1578. Historians believe a wealthy landowner buried the hoard before leaving to fight in the English Civil War. 
In accordance with the 1996 Treasure Act, Mahoney notified the proper authorities of the suspected treasure. Medieval Pope Seal Earlier this year, a metal detectorist in Shropshire, England, discovered a seal belonging to Pope Innocent IV. While this coin-like thing might not seem that exciting, it marks the milestone of 1.5 million items that have been unearthed by the public in Britain under the British Museum's Portable Antiquities Scheme, which encourages citizens to come forward with artifacts in hopes of learning more about the area's history. Dating back to the 13th century, the lead, coin-like artifact was reportedly used for conferring religious and political favors. It may have ended up at its discovery site as a result of the Pope trying to gain Henry III's support in his campaign to claim Sicily. Another possibility, according to Peter Reville, the British Museum's Portable Antiquities Scheme Finds Liaison Officer, was that a wealthy person received the seal in exchange for paying an indulgence to keep him out of purgatory. Reville, who spoke with the Daily Mail, explained that the seal wasn't extremely valuable, but spoke to the richness of the region's archaeology more than anything else. Iron Age Coin Hoard In 2012, a hoard containing nearly 70,000 coins set the new Guinness World Record for the largest discovery of its type in the British Isles. Discovered in January 2012 by metal detectorists Reg Mead and Richard Miles in Jersey, the largest of the Channel Islands, the 69,347 coin collection is worth an estimated $13 million. The find defeats the previous record set over 40 years ago in 1978, with a discovery of 54,951 Iron Age coins in Wiltshire, England. Some of the coins in the more recently discovered hoard date back to 50 BC. Made of silver and gold, they were found beneath a hedge in a mound of clay three feet underground. Some of the coins have an image of a horse on one side and on the other side a depiction of Apollo. It's believed the trove was hidden on the island by the Coriosolite tribe, from Brittany and France, to hide it from approaching Roman legions. Although Mead and Miles were entitled to reward for their remarkable find, the coins are considered treasure under the 1996 Treasure Act, making them official property of the Queen. However, since the pair were responsible for finding them, the detectorists were in line for a significant prize and will go down in history books for their find. They are very excited to have received the Guinness World Record. Tomb 7 at Monte Alban The Mixtec people are considered to be some of the most extraordinary artisans of Mesoamerica. Dating back to around 1000 to 1697 AD, they occupied the areas of Oaxaca to Puebla and Tlaxcala in Mexico. They, along with some Zapotec people, were known to the Aztecs as cloud people since they lived high up in the mountains. One mountaintop archaeological site, the former city of Monte Alban, consists of numerous tombs used by the Zapotecs and the Mixtecs. Inside Tomb 7, there is a Zapotec chamber that the Mixtecs reused for one of their burials. Inside is full of objects made from precious materials, mostly sculptures made of gold, demonstrating their delicate skills and eye for detail. There are pectorals, or big gold chest plates, decorated with masks and faces of animals and deities. There are also countless necklaces, rings, bracelets, fan handles, nail protectors, and carved sculptures. Largely considered one of the richest archaeological finds of its time, Tomb 7 also contains nine skeletons, jade necklaces, bells, and other offerings. The Zapotecs originally built and lived at Monte Alban, which means White Mountain, where they built a ball court, temples, palaces, and more. The city at its peak had about 25,000 people, but was largely abandoned around 700 AD, when the royalty and priests left. Experts aren't sure why people left Monte Alban, but there are no signs of a military presence or warfare taking place. The Mixtecs arrived later on and repurposed the city as their own, adding to the buildings and architecture. Today, the site of Monte Alban, and especially Tomb 7, is one of the richest archaeological finds to date. Mysterious Medieval Brooch In May 2019, a metal detectorist in Norfolk, England, made quite the discovery when he found a 1,100-year-old medieval brooch in a truckload of topsoil that was used in a landscaping project. It was a lucky find for the discoverer, who came across the brooch on his third day exploring as an amateur metal detectorist. He originally thought that the artifact was Victorian, but he alerted authorities just in case, as is required by law in the UK, and archaeologists reported to the scene and correctly identified it as medieval. 
Dating back to the late 9th century, the silver disc was hailed by archaeologists as a discovery of national importance. Measuring roughly 3 inches in diameter, it features a cross and animals, and bears similarities to objects found in the nearby Pentney Hoard, which was discovered in 1978 and contained 6 brooches. It looks to me that they were made by the same craftsman or in the same workshop, Stephen Ashley, Norfolk County Council's senior finds archaeologist, told the BBC. But nobody knows exactly where the soil the recently discovered brooch was found in came from, and it's likely that researchers will never determine the location of the artifact's origin. I think it would be very hard to trace the provenance of the brooch now, Ashley said. I think it will remain a mystery. Have you ever used a metal detector? It seems like a lot of fun. Let me know in the comments below. Roman Shipwreck Graveyard the recently announced discovery of a Mediterranean ship graveyard that archaeologists detected using sonar back in 2009 is shedding light on the Roman world of 2,000 years ago. There are five trading boats that make up the graveyard sitting on the sea floor near the Italian island of Ventotene, 328 feet beneath the water's surface. This makes them some of the deepest wrecks ever discovered in the Mediterranean. They are all in pristine condition, despite dating all the way back between the 1st century BC and the 5th century AD. The ships were likely heading toward Ventotene to anchor during rough weather, as was customary for seafaring vessels to do at the time, but they succumbed to the rough seas before they could reach safety and sank to the bottom of the sea, where they've remained untouched ever since. According to researchers, the sunken trading ships were carrying wine from Italy and fish sauce from Spain and North Africa, as well as a mysterious, unidentified cargo, perhaps supplies that may have been used for making weapons. In any case, these ships are in excellent shape. Gothic Jewelry A collection of jewelry and ornaments dating back between the 1st and 4th centuries has been discovered in a village in Poland. Found in a Gothic cemetery in northern Poland, it has been declared to be as good as that produced by the Romans. Dr. Magdalena Natunowicz Sekula from Warsaw's Institute of Archaeology and Ethnology at the Polish Academy of Sciences was the leading archaeologist who analyzed the jewelry and ornaments found at the burial site. The artifacts were found in a cemetery that was used by the Goths, as well as an Eastern Germanic tribe called the Gepids. Altogether, the collection contains around 3,500 items that were buried with the dead, including precious and semi-precious metals, as well as clay, glass, and amber objects. Dr. Natunyevich Sekula's analysis revealed a high level of expertise in metalwork and crafting, including silver pieces that are between 92 and 97 percent pure, and other objects made from ore purer than that which is used for modern jewelry. In fact, creating jewelry with these materials today would simply be too costly for most manufacturers. The metalsmiths who made these items were highly skilled in advanced and intricate techniques, such as granulation and filigree. These findings conflict with the long-held stereotypical view that so-called barbarian jewelry was of inferior quality compared to the Romans. After all, they were barbarians! They also suggest that bullion bars were imported to the region from the Roman Empire despite a strict ban, as evidenced by a lack of equipment that would have been used for refining the materials that the jewelry was made with, or that the Goths somehow had other sophisticated means of separating noble and base metals. Neolithic Figurines Archaeological discoveries in the Near East from the early Neolithic period, which started during the 9th millennium BC, are very scarce so when anything is found, it is automatically considered an archaeological treasure. There is very little information about what humans were doing and how they developed in this area. Luckily, an entire collection of flint artifacts were discovered at a site in Jordan. While they look like flint tools, when you look at them more closely, they actually look more like human forms. Were these early people carving the human figure? They were discovered in burials, leading the team to theorize that the artifacts are Neolithic figurines, made and then discarded during mortuary rituals and remembrance ceremonies involving human remains. But the meaning of the 10,000-year-old objects, which come in different shapes and sizes, is not truly known, and scientists are trying to discover their meaning. Definitively learning what the figurines were used for would be an important step to understanding the social and psychological changes that early societies in the region went through as they transitioned to agriculture-based communities. Royal Bronze Age Tombs 
In late 2019, a team of American archaeologists from the University of Cincinnati, who were working in Greece's southern Peloponnese near the ancient city of Pylos, announced the discovery of two 3,500-year-old Royal Bronze Age tombs filled with treasures near a palace from the Mycenaean era. Included among the finds were amethyst and amber items, as well as a gold ring featuring an engraved image of a bull surrounded by grain and a gold pendant bearing the likeness of an Egyptian goddess who protected the dead. Flakes of gold were also found in the tombs, suggesting that the floors were once covered in gold leaf. The team unearthed the dome-shaped tombs in 2018 as part of a two-year excavation project, and the process was nothing short of grueling, requiring the removal of around 40,000 stones, according to a statement from the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports. As painstaking as the task was, the rubble was beneficial for the tombs because it made them inaccessible to grave robbers. The discovery offers invaluable insight into the Mycenaean civilization's early phases, during which time many of ancient Greece's myths and legends originated, including the story of the Trojan War. It has been 50 years since any substantial tombs of this sort have been found at any Bronze Age palatial site, Jack Davis, head of UC's Classics Department, told CNN. That makes this extraordinary. Pre-Revolutionary Gem while excavating a colonial-era tavern dating back to the 1730s at the Brunswick Town slash Fort Anderson historic site and pre-revolutionary port in North Carolina, an archaeology student discovered a jewel inscribed with the words Wilkes and Liberty 45. Using ground-penetrating radar, the student at first thought he had simply found a pebble. Thankfully, he scrubbed it with a toothbrush and found what looked like some writing on the object. The student took the artifact to Charles Ewan, a professor at East Carolina University and the director of Phelps Archaeology Laboratory. Upon further inspection using a light table, macro lens, and camera, Ewan realized the thumbnail-sized pressed glass jewel's worth. The phrase, Wilkes and Liberty 45, was an early slogan referencing revolutionist and journalist John Wilkes, who strongly and openly criticized British rule over what later became the United States. It was used by those who wanted to break away from King George III of Great Britain, symbolizing the beginnings of the rebellious spirit that led to the American Revolution. The jewel was once attached to a pair of cufflinks, and the inscription it bears first served as a secret message against British rule during the 1760s, and an inconspicuous way for revolutionists to identify each other, and it ultimately became a rallying cry of opposition as the movement for American independence grew. $394 million shipwreck hoard. Back in 1804, a treasure-laden ship called the Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes sank off Portugal's Cape St. Mary during a battle. The wreck was discovered in 2007 by Odyssey Marine Exploration. The U.S.-based salvage company raised 594,000 gold and silver coins, totaling a value of roughly $394 million, and sent the treasure to Tampa, Florida. Subsequent dives led by Cartagena's National Museum of Underwater Archaeology, or ARCWA, which is managed by Spain's Culture Ministry, began in 2014. The first of three expeditions so far yielded thousands of artifacts as researchers ventured into the heart of the ship, including anchors, iron and bronze cannon, copper and tin ingots, a silver dinner service and cutlery, silver candlesticks, a gold pestle, and others, according to a report from the University of Warsaw. The treasures show what early 19th century life was like, making their scientific and historic value immeasurable. Researchers believe the ship sank before Spain joined France in the Napoleonic Wars against Britain, which started after the breakdown of the 1802 Treaty of Amiens between France and Britain. Rare Viking Artifacts Climate change is revealing previously undiscovered artifacts in many parts of the world as glaciers, permafrost, and other long-frozen ice melts for the first time in centuries or longer. One such place is Norway, where archaeologists discovered a so-called treasure trove of rare artifacts earlier this year along a forgotten mountain pass. The winding path of the Lendbreen Glacier contains hundreds of remarkably well-preserved objects dating back to the Viking Age, the Roman Iron Age, and the Bronze Age. The finds, which are detailed in the journal Antiquity, include clothing, fabric, shoes, horseshoes, tools, riding gear, a walking stick, animal bones, and dung, all offering valuable glimpses into daily life in the region during the past, as well as the challenges and necessity of mountain travel.
Situated between 5,500 and 6,300 feet above sea level, the disappearing glacier's artifacts and the long hidden trail they are scattered along first appeared in 2011. The items which were discovered between then and 2015 remained well preserved due to spending centuries encased in ice and thanks to the region's dry, frozen climate. Carbon dating shows that the trail was continuously used between 300 and 1500 AD and that it peaked during the Viking Age, around 1000 AD. Travelers likely abandoned used and unwanted objects as well as dead animals along the trail as they pushed forward in the harsh environment. Other items were likely lost. One mystery, according to archaeologists, is why people seem to throw away perfectly usable goods, including clothing. Experts suggest that irrational behavior resulting from severe hypothermia could explain this. The details of more recent discoveries in 2019 of numerous artifacts in the area, including a leashed dog, have yet to be officially described. Magical Iron Age Treasure The earliest example of Iron Age gold ever discovered in Britain was found in 2016 in Staffordshire, England by treasure hunters Mark Hamilton and Joe Kanya. They were ready to give up after a long day of absolutely zero luck when Kanya announced that he thought he spotted something. That something turned out to be a mud-covered collection of jewelry, including a bracelet and four twisted metal neckbands called torques. Harboring the sneaking suspicion that they had encountered extremely valuable artifacts, the pair vowed to keep the items safe until they turned them into experts. Hamilton said he slept with the items right next to his bed before relinquishing them to the Portable Antiquities Scheme in Birmingham. It was then that the duo learned that their discovery could be worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. Experts were impressed, to say the least, including Dr. Julia Farley, the British Museum's curator of British and European Iron Age collections, who lauded the unique find as being of international importance. In Dr. Farley's words, the treasure dates back to around 400 to 250 BC and is probably the earliest Iron Age gold work ever discovered in Britain. She further explained that the jewelry likely belonged to wealthy and powerful women, who probably migrated to the area from mainland Europe to marry prominent figures within the community. 4,000-year-old paintings Starting back in 2001 at Tel El Burak, an archaeological site in southern Lebanon, a Lebanese and German team of archaeologists from the American University of Beirut and the University of Tübingen discovered a series of fresco paintings that are believed to be the oldest in the Mediterranean region. The well-preserved artwork was found at an ancient palace, with the most recent discoveries taking place in 2019. The images depict the Tree of Life, an ancient symbol of fertility and growth, as well as a procession and hunting scenes. Researchers remarked that the murals are important because they show that early fresco-making techniques were not just developed in Europe, but in the Near East. The images were made using Egyptian blue, a pigment dating back to around 3000 BC. Its use is indicative not only of the mural's possible age, but of the trading ties that once existed between ancient Egypt and the region's inhabitants, who are thought to be ancestors of the Phoenicians. The murals, along with the recent discovery of the oldest known Phoenician wine press, show that experts have a long way to go when it comes to fully understanding the region's past and the people who once occupied it. Thanks for watching! Which archaeological treasure or artifact was your favorite? If you have any exciting topic ideas for future videos, be sure to share them in the comments below. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time!